Good morning. Praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Welcome to Victorious Faith. I'm Cherry Campbell. We're studying the lesson, Proofs That Abundance Is God's Will. Proofs That Abundance Is God's Will. We are currently on proof number 18, and that is looking at God's covenant and covenants, but proof number 18 is particularly the old covenant. And seeing that in the covenant, there are requirements and rewards and prosperity and abundance is one of the rewards for keeping the covenant. So proof number 18, prosperity and abundance is a reward for keeping God's covenant. And when you look at covenant, you have to study the blood covenant to understand. We d- I mentioned last week that I did a teaching on the blood covenant early in the uh, this radio program. It's on my website called the blood covenant. And if you didn't hear that series, I encourage you go to my website at victoriousfaith.co. Victorious is like a champion. V-I-C-T-O-R-I-O-U-S. Faith, F-A-I-T-H dot C-O, C-O like Colorado. Go to the radio broadcast archives, go down the list and look for the Blood Covenant series. Listen to that. It's 10 programs and I walk through the Blood Covenant process with you, explaining each part of the cutting of a covenant. And then I showed you how Jesus fulfilled every part for us. Praise the Lord. But it helps you to understand the whole blood covenant concept because in America today, we don't practice blood covenants. Now, some parts of the world still do, particularly those parts of the world that still hold ancient traditions because the practice of blood covenant goes back to the oldest days of mankind. And you need to understand blood covenant in order to understand even fully what our relationship is with God, because Jesus gave us the blood covenant in his blood. And he also fulfilled that covenant. As I said, he fulfilled every part of that covenant for us. Praise the Lord. And you need to understand that I explained how that Revelation became an anchor for my faith 20 plus years ago. And by understanding the blood covenant, my faith in God is rooted in, in understanding blood covenant. It's in blood. And that's how and why I can be confident that I have and I can receive God's promises. Now we've also explained Friday last week, I spent most all the program answering the question. Then if this is the reward, like we read in Proverbs 13, 21, prosperity is the reward of the righteous. Then why aren't all Christians prosperous and wealthy and abundant? And I explained to you that there is a, There are two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of God and there's the kingdom of this world. God's kingdom does not operate by the laws and methods of the kingdom of this world. He has his own laws, his own methods, his own MO. And we call them the spiritual laws of the kingdom. And we will only receive God's blessings and promises by his MO. His method of operation, his spiritual laws. You don't get God's promises by man's methods. You got that? You do not receive God's promises by man's methods. It'll never, ever happen. You don't get results. That's why Christians don't get results. That's why Some Christians do not get healed. Some Christians are not prosperous because you don't get God's promises by man's methods. 
You have to know God's methods and his methods are the spiritual laws of the kingdom of God. And I taught that in our our last series about why some Christians do not get healed. It was the same reason as why some Christians are not prosperous and abundant. And it relates all entirely to the spiritual laws of the kingdom of God. Starting with lack of knowledge, not knowing them. Another thing is not believing. When you hear there are people who hear this teaching about prosperity or healing and they don't believe it. They deny it. Some people hate it. Christians don't like this kind of teaching. So they deny it. They don't believe it. So there is unbelief and then or disbelief. And then another reason is people think it's all up to God. They're waiting on God to make it happen. God, when will you heal me? God, when will you prosper us? God, when will you fix this? And we looked last Friday at second Peter one, three and four. God, his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. He has already given us everything we need. He gave us the spiritual laws of the kingdom and he taught us what they are. He gave us his name, which is above every other name. And at that name, every knee shall bow on earth, under the earth and above earth. And at that name, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He gave us his name. He gave us his authority in his name. He gave us his word. And by his word, we have faith because of his word, believing his word. We have faith. He has given us his spirit, which is his power. His Holy Spirit is his power. The Holy Spirit is his anointing. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of wisdom and guidance. So he gave us his spirit to give us wisdom and guidance, to give us power and anointing. He gave us his name, which gives us authority. He gave us his word, which gives us faith, or we have to believe it. And we have faith in his word. He has given us everything we need. People are saying, God, when will you do something? God says, I've given you the ball. I've put the ball in your court. Take it up. Use it. Second Peter one, three and four. His divine power has has, has already given us everything we need. God says, quit asking me. I've given you everything you need. Now you do need to listen to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is your daily guidance, teacher, counselor, wisdom. He will show you every day, step by step what to do, but you do it. He has given us everything we need. For life, that's physical, and godliness, that's spiritual. How? Through our knowledge of him. You see, it's all by knowledge of him and his ways. When you walk in his ways, you get results. And his ways are the spiritual laws of the kingdom. And we've named seven primary spiritual laws, the law of love, the law of faith, the law of the creative power of words, the law of authority and dominion to rule, the law of sowing and reaping, the law of wisdom, the law of obedience. Most all of these are on my website, radio broadcast archives, the law of spiritual authority. I have not yet posted because it's really long. We did it for six months and When my, when my website was rebuilt, it has not yet been posted, but I do have it on an MP3. If you need it for a donation of any amount, you can write to me for a donation. I can send you the MP3 about the law of spiritual authority. The others are on the website, YouTube channel. There's also MP3s for them available. And the kingdom of God series is the foundation series. It was the introduction series. It's the platform from which all the others on which all the others are built. You need to understand the kingdom of God. Then you need to understand the spiritual laws of the kingdom. 
And then go back to Second Peter 1, 4. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises. So it's through our knowledge of him, knowledge of his ways. And how do we get the knowledge? Through his promises. How do you get the knowledge? Through his promises, you could say through his word, by his word, so that through them, through the word, you may participate in the divine nature. You may participate in the victory, the authority, the anointing, the power of God, the victory. You will participate in and escape the corruption. Paraphrase that, the curse of sin and death. That's in the world, the corruption in the world, paraphrased the curse of sin and death that's in the world caused by evil desires, paraphrase that caused by sin, caused by sin. The curse of sin and death is in the world. The curse of sin and death includes sickness, disease, pain, weakness, lack, poverty, hunger, fear, worry, anxieties, torments, depression. All of that caused by the curse of sin and death. You will escape that curse of sin and death and participate in the divine nature, the victory, the anointing, the power, the authority of God, which get, and his glory by his word, by his word, by these precious promises, his word. So you see, God has given it to you in his word and taught you by his word and by his Holy Spirit, how to walk in his ways so that you can participate in the divine nature. You can participate in the anointing, the power and the authority and the glory of God and the victory. And escape the corruption, the curse of sin and death that's in the world caused by sin. Hallelujah. Now, I shared that with you last week. That's how you get the victory by his word and by learning and practicing his spiritual laws of the kingdom. Again, I encourage you go to my website at victoriousfaith.co. Go to the radio broadcast archives. Start with the Kingdom of God series. That's the platform. Kingdom of God. Platform. Inter- uh, foundational teaching. And then go to the spiritual laws. The law of faith. The law of wisdom. The law of, of pow- the power of words. The law of sowing and reaping. Etc. Study them. Exercise them. Praise the Lord. Now, we are talking still about the old covenant and the rewards God promised in his word. He said, remember a covenant, a blood covenant has requirements and rewards requirements that we must fulfill and rewards for fulfilling it and keeping the covenant. And we started with looking at Abraham. We saw the promise. We saw the reward. Then we looked at Isaac The promise and the reward. We looked at Jacob, the promise and the reward fulfilled. All three, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob became very wealthy. The Bible says very wealthy as it says about Abraham. He became very wealthy in livestock, in silver and in gold, sheep and cattle, men, servants and maidservants, camels and donkeys. Isaac, Genesis 26, 13 became rich. And his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. Jacob, it says he grew exceedingly prosperous, exceedingly prosperous. That word exceedingly we saw has to do with God's covenant name, El Shaddai. He said, I will make you exceeding, exceedingly fruitful, exceedingly prosperous. Jacob grew exceedingly prosperous and came to own large flocks and maid servants, man servants, camels and donkeys. Then we looked at Israel. We particularly looked at the command and promises in Deuteronomy chapters five, seven, 
28, 29, 30. We also looked at Proverbs 13, 21. Prosperity is the reward of the righteous. We looked at Isaiah 1, 19, and we looked at Mark 10. In Mark 10, Jesus in the New Testament confirms the reward for obeying God. Jesus confirms the reward in Mark 10, verses 28 to 30, and he promises 100 fold for obeying God. God, Jesus promised 100 fold for obeying God. Now, I, I don't want to spend more time in that. You can read Mark 10, 28 to 30. You can also listen to these programs from last week as I'm reviewing them on my website. They're available. You can go back and listen to them again. Now let's move on. I started touching on this last week, but let's look at Job. Now, Job did not have the same covenant as Abraham. He had his own covenant as you would. If you study the uh, Bible and, and study the book of Job, most Bible scholars that I have read have said that Job probably lived in the time of Abraham. He was in Abraham's era, which is, of course, 400 years before the law. There was no law. This was in the time when God made personal relationships with different ones on earth through covenant, through covenant, not law, through covenant. And Job was probably a contemporary of Abraham, but had his own covenant with God. So let's look at Job chapter one in the land of us. Verse one, Job one, one in the land of us or ooze, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. Now I've heard and read where some Christians write like Job was sinless and perfect, but that's not ever what the word blameless means in the Bible, because no human being besides Jesus has ever been sinless. No one besides Jesus has been sinless. No one has been perfect. No one has fully understood God's ways and walked in them perfectly. Absolutely sinlessly. So the word blameless does not mean Job was sinless. And it does not mean he did everything perfect. As we've said before, the word blameless means whole hearted and wholly devoted. For example, in first Kings eight 61, God said, but your hearts must be fully committed to the Lord, our God to live by his decrees and obey his commands. That is the definition of blameless in the old Testament. First Kings Eight sixty one would be the definition of the word blameless. First Kings eight sixty one. But your hearts must be fully committed to the Lord, our God. To live by his decrees and obey his commands. So that's blameless being fully committed as we've read elsewhere, wholly devoted, wholehearted. Meaning God is your God and only God. He's your one and only God. You do not, as other commands, you have no other gods before him. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So Job was blameless. He was wholehearted, wholly devoted to God. Glory to God. And God blessed him and made him wealthy. It says in Job 1, verse 3, it says he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man 
among all the people of the East, among all the people of the East. That's probably east of the promised land given to Abraham. Because Abraham was in the promised land and he was the greatest man in his land. And that he lived actually in what is modern day Israel. Job lived east of that actually notes Bible notes say that the land of us would have been probably um, connected with Edom and Taman and some of these other names. And so it was east of what is modern day Israel. So Abraham was the greatest man in his territory east of him. Job was the greatest man east of where Abraham lived. And that's the way I understand this because it says the people of the east. Abraham was not living in what was called the east. Abraham did not live in the land called the east. He went from the east. He went westward to what God promised him and the region of Moriah. That's where modern Israel is today. So Job lived in the land called the East. That's not where Abraham lived. And so Abraham was the greatest man in his land. Job was the greatest man in his land. And it says he owned 7,000 sheep. 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and a large number of servants. And then we see, yes, he did go through a test. I'm not going to teach on that right now. He was tested by God and attacked by the enemy, the devil, Satan. And I won't go into that right now. But then... God restored Job's wealth, but not only did he restore Job's wealth in Job 42, the last chapter of the book of Job, verse 42, chapter 42, I mean, chapter 42, verse 10, after Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord made him prosperous again. What did God do? prosper, prosperous, wealth, and gave him twice as much as he had before. The Lord made him prosperous. So this is when he was restored at the end of the testing and he repented for his wrong words, wrong thinking, wrong believing. And When he repented, then he prayed for his friends. And then God made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as he had before. Well, how much was twice as much? Well, let's look at it. Job, let's go back to chapter one. Job one, verse three. He owned 7,000 sheep in the beginning. Job one, three, in the beginning, He owned 7,000 sheep. In the end, Job 42, Job 42, verse 12, he had 14,000 sheep. So you see, it's double. In the beginning, he had 7,000. And then in Job 42, 12, the Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the first. He had double. He had 14,000. Seven times two is 14. Then the sheep, that was the sheep. He had 7,000 sheep. He then later had 14,000. In the beginning, he had 3,000 camels. In the end, he had 6,000 camels. He doubled from 3,000 camels to 6,000 camels. Then Job 1, 3, he had 500 yoke of oxen. 
In the end, he had a thousand yoke of oxen. He doubled. And in the beginning, he had 500 donkeys. In the end, he had a thousand donkeys. He doubled his donkeys. So his sheep doubled, his camels doubled, his yoke of oxen doubled, and his donkeys doubled. Praise the Lord. And then he also had seven sons and three daughters. And then verse 16, Job 42, 16. After this, Job lived a hundred and forty years. That was on top of the years he had lived up until the time of the test. So who knows how old he was when he was tested. But after his test, he lived a hundred and forty years. What do we see? Long life. He saw his children and his and their children to the fourth generation and the last verse of the last chapter, he, so he died old and full of years, old and full of years. So Job doubled his wealth and he died old and full of years, long life and wealth, long life and wealth were God's reward to Job for keeping his covenant. Praise the Lord. We see it again and again and again through the Bible. And we see it even in Job who had his own covenant with God. God blessed him, made him very wealthy, the greatest man of the East and gave him long life, made him old and full of years. Glory to God. Well, join me again tomorrow. And remember, God loves you. You're blessed and highly favored by the Lord.